if Sunday. We travel back in time now here on Goal to January 1975 as Kenneth Williams tells another Jack and Ori. Yesterday I told you what happened after Countess Gruffanoff gave Betsinda the fairy black stick's magic ring and Bulbo gave Angelica his magic rose, also made by the fairy black stick. Giglio had escaped to the university town of Bosforo and under the name of Mr Giles he had followed black stick's advice and worked hard. He still had the magic bag that gave him any object he really needed and after a year's hard work he had won all the examination prizes. Now he was celebrating in a coffee house with his two friends, Smith and Jones. He happened to glance at the Bosforo Chronicle and aloud he read a paragraph headed Romantic Circumstances. It will be remembered, he read, that when the present sovereign of Crim Tartary, His Majesty King Padella, came to the throne after having conquered the late King Cavalfiore, that his daughter, Princess Rosalba, was said to have strayed into the forest where she'd been eaten up by those ferocious lions, the last pair of which were captured some time since and brought to the tower after killing several hundred people. Her death had seemed to be certain. The remains of a cloak and a little shoe were found in the forest during a hunting party in which His Majesty slew two of the lion cubs with his own musket. Last Tuesday week, Baron Spinacci and a number of followers appeared in arms crying, God save Rosalba, the first queen of Crim Tartary, and surrounding a lady whom report describes as beautiful exceedingly. This person states that she was brought out of the forest 15 years since by a lady in a chariot drawn by dragons, that she was left in the palace garden of our generous King Valoroso, where the Princess Angelica found the child and gave the little outcast a shelter and a home. The child was educated at the palace as a lady's maid under the name Betsinda. She quit the palace about a year ago on the very same morning that Prince Giglio, nephew to King Valoroso, also left the capital and has not been heard of since. What an extraordinary story, said Smith and Jones. But there was more. The paper told how the general, Count Hoginamo, had captured the princess and sent her to King Padella, who had thrown her into a dungeon. All this news greatly disturbed Mr. Giles. Come home with me, my friends, he said. I have that to tell shall astonish you. Well, go to it, Giles, old boy, says Smith. Yes, talk away, my buck, says Jones. Jones, Smith, Sergilio, my good friends, disguise is henceforth useless. I am no more the humble servant, Giles. I am the descendant of a royal line. I am that Giglio. I am, in fact, king of Paphlagonia. My faithless uncle, when I was a baby, filched from me that brave crown my father left me and soothed me with promise of near redress. I should wed his daughter, young Angelica. We two, indeed, should reign in Paphlagonia. This was the beginning of a very long, fine speech telling Smith and Jones the story so far. The prince and his friends hurried home, and there, in his room, on the writing table, was his bag, grown so long that the prince could not help noticing it. Inside it, he found a splendid, long, gold-handled, velvet-scabbarded sword, and on the sheath was embroidered, Rosalba forever. Then his trunk opened with a sudden ping, and in there were three ostrich feathers in a gold crown surrounding a beautiful shining steel helmet, a pair of spurs, and a complete suit of armour. The books on Giglio's shelves were all gone, and where there had been some great dictionaries, Giglio's friends now found two pairs of jack boots labelled Lieutenant Smith and T. Jones Esquire, which fitted them perfectly. Beside these were helmets, back and breastplates, swords, spears, and so on. They hired horses at a livery stable, and that evening the three cavaliers rode out of the city gates. They didn't pause till they reached the last town on the frontier before you come to Crim Tartary. Here they stopped at an inn for refreshments and to rest their horses. 
As the three friends were taking some bread and cheese and ale upstairs on the balcony of the inn, they heard drums and trumpets sounding nearer and nearer. The marketplace was filled with soldiers, and His Royal Highness recognized the Paphlagonian banners and the Paphlagonian national anthem which the band was playing. The troops all made for the tavern at once, and as they came up, Giglio recognized their leader. It is my gallant friend, Captain Headsorf, he said. Oh, Headsorf, knowest thou not thy prince, thy Giglio? Ah, Sergeant, tell me, what means this mighty armament, and whither march my Paphlagonians? Headsorf's face fell. My lord, we march as the allies of great Padella, Crim Tartar is monarch. Crim Tartar is grim tyrant, honest Headsorf, said the prince. My orders, Prince, are to help His Majesty Padella and also to seize Giglio, Prince of Paphlagonia, wherever I should find him, said Hedzorf. My Prince, give up your sword without ado. Look, we are 30,000 men to one. Give up my sword, cried the Prince, stepping to the front of the balcony. Never! And without preparation, he delivered a speech so magnificent that no report can do it justice. The speech lasted for three days and three nights, and he told the whole history of the wrongs done to himself and Rosalba. At the end of this extraordinary effort, Captain Hedzoff and all his troops shouted, Hooray! Hooray! Long live King Giglio! Such were the results of having employed his time so well at college. When the excitement had ceased, Edzorf told the prince that his regiment was only the advanced guard of the Paphlagonian army. The main force was a day's march in the rear under the command of His Royal Highness, Prince Bulbo. We will wait here, good friend, to beat the prince, His Majesty said, and then we'll make his royal father wince. At about this time, the royal father in question, Padella, was in his deepest, darkest dungeon visiting his prisoner, Rosalba. He offered to marry her, but she refused his invitation quite politely, saying that Prince Giglio was her love and that any other marriage was out of the question. Having tried a gentle approach, the violent-tempered monarch menaced her with threats and tortures, but she declared that she would rather suffer all these than accept the hand of her father's murderer. After he finally left her, Padella spent the whole night considering how he should punish this stubborn young creature. Then. He remembered the pair of lions which had been sent to him as presents, and he decided to use these fierce brutes to rid himself of Rosalba. Close to his castle was an arena where the king watched ferocious sports like bull baiting and rat catching. The inhabitants of the city flocked to see this poor young lady gobbled up by two wild beasts. The king took his place in the royal box with the Count Hoginamo by his side, and the king had heard from his spies that the Count had himself proposed to Rosalba before he had sent her as a prisoner to the king. So Padella was gazing fiercely and distrustfully at the Count as they sat waiting for the tragic end of poor Rosalba. At length, the princess was brought out in her nightgown, looking so pretty that even the guards and animal keepers felt pity for her. She walked into the arena and leaned against a great stone there. All round, protected by iron bars, sat the courtiers and the people waiting for the great, fierce, red-maned, roaring, bellowing lions. Now the gates were thrown open, and with a wara 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 two great, lean, hungry lions rushed out of their den, where they'd been kept for three weeks on nothing but a little toast and water. Now, even King Padella felt a little sorry, but Count Hoginamo shouted, Hurrah! Now for it! for he was still uncommonly angry at Rosalba's refusal of him. But it's a strange and remarkable circumstance and an extraordinary coincidence. When the lions came up to Rosalba, instead of eating her up, they licked her feet, they nuzzled their noses in her lap and seemed almost to say, Dear Rosalba, don't you remember us in the forest? And she put her arms round their necks and kissed them. King Padella was astonished. Count Hoginamo was disgusted. Pooh, gammon! he exclaimed. These lions are tame beasts from the circus. It's a sham. I believe they're boys dressed up in doormats. They're not lions at all. Aha, said the king. These are no lions at all, aren't they? How, my bodyguard, take this Count Hoginamo and fling him into the arena. Give him a sword and buckler. Let him fight these lions. The Count scowled at the king and his bodyguards. Touch me not, dogs! he said, and opening the grating of the box, he jumped lightly down into the arena and... Rah!
In about two minutes, the Count Hog in armor was gobbled up by those lions, bones, boots, and all. And there was an end of him. The king said, serve him right, the rebellious ruffian. And now, as those lions won't eat that young woman, the crowd shouted, let her off, let her off. No, roared the king. Let the guards go down and chop her into small pieces. Ah, cried the crowd, shame, shame. Fling any scoundrel who cries shame to the lions, roared the king. There was dead silence then, which was broken by the sound of a trumpet as a knight and a herald rode into the arena. Ha, huh, said the king. Tis elephant and castle, herald of my brother of Paphlagonia, and the knight, as my memory serves me, is the gallant Captain Hedzoff. What news from Paphlagonia, gallant Hedzoff? Oh, I'll be speaking first, safe conduct from your lordship, said the captain. Permit us to deliver our king's message. My lordship, said Padella, that title soundeth strange in the ears of a crowned king. Straightway speak out your message, knight and herald. Elephant and Castle took a large sheet of paper out of his hat and began to read. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, he began and went on at great length that Giglio, king of Paphlagonia, summoned the traitor Padella to release the rightful sovereign Rosalba, queen of Crim Tartary. The message warned that if Padella did not release her, I, Giglio, proclaim the said Padella traitor, usurper, coward, humbug and sneak. I challenge him to meet me alone or the head of his army and will prove my words by force of arms. God save the king, said Hedzoff. Padella was furious. Is that all? And what says Valoroso, my son's father-in-law, to this rubbish? Asked the king. Oh, the king's uncle has been deprived of the crown he unjustly wore, answered Hedzoff, after the battle of Bombardaro. Of what? asked the surprised Padella, of Bombardaro, where my liege, his present majesty, would have performed deeds of great valour if the whole of Valoroso's army had not come over to our side, with the exception of Prince Bulbo. Ah, my boy Bulbo was no traitor, cried Padella. It seemed that Bulbo had not changed size, he'd run away instead, but he'd been caught. And as Hedzoff said, the most terrific tortures await him if a hair of the Princess Rosalba's head is injured. Do they indeed, exclaimed Bellella, now livid with rage. So much the worse for Bulbo. I've 20 sons as good as Bulbo, and dear as Bulbo is to me, ha, 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 revenge is dearer still. Executioner's hole, light up the fires and make the pincers hot. Get lots of boiling oil. Bring out Rosalba. Captain Hedzoff and the Herald did not wait to see Rosalba's fate. What could two do against so many? When they returned to Giglio's camp, Hedzoff found His Majesty anxiously waiting in the royal tent. He was not calmed by the news that Hedzoff had brought. And didst thou see her flung into the oil? Well, faith, my good liege, I had no heart to see a beauteous lady boiling down. I told Padella what you would do to Prince Bulbo. He forthwith bade the executioners proceed. Giglio ordered Bulbo to be brought to the tent. Giglio told the prince that his father had put Rosalba to death, and Bulbo was so moved and grieved that the king felt pity for him and said he'd wished he'd known Bulbo sooner. Then Giglio told Bulbo that because of Padella's cruel actions, Prince Bulbo must be executed next morning at eight o'clock. Of course, Bulbo quite understood. A promise is a promise. He was taken to the dungeon in the town where every attention was paid to him, the turnkey's daughter begged him to write his name in her album. Bother your album, said Bulbo, and he sat down and tried writing a farewell letter to Angelica, but the clock kept ticking and the hands drew all was nearer to next morning. At last, the town clock struck seven. So Bulbo got into bed for a little sleep, but too soon the jailer came and woke him. Get up, your royal highness, if you please. It's ten minutes to height. So Bulbo got up and the soldiers came for him. Lead on, he said and they took him out into the square where King Giglio was waiting to say farewell and shake hands. The gloomy procession marched on when suddenly... No, I'll tell you about that tomorrow. Goodbye. Something seems to be fun. We left 
Prince Bulbo at eight o'clock in the morning, about to be executed by order of King Giglio, following the report of the execution of Queen Rosalba by Bulbo's father, King Padella. The gloomy procession marched on with Bulbo to the place of execution when suddenly, a roar of wild beasts was heard and who should come riding into the town but Rosalba herself. The fact is that when Captain Hedzorf was talking to King Padella in the great arena, the lions made a dash for the open gate, gobbled up six beef eaters and rushed away with Rosalba on the back of one of them. They carried her turn and turn about till they came to the city where Giglio's army was encamped. When the king heard of Rosalba's arrival, he rushed out of his tent to meet her. The lions had grown as fat as pigs now, having eaten Count Hoginamo and all those beef eaters, and were so tame that anyone might pat them. Giglio helped Rosalba off the lion's back, and Bulbo rushed up laughing and crying for joy. Oh, how glad I am to see you, dear, dear Betsy, that is, Rosalba. What is it you, poor Bulbo, said the queen. I am glad to see you. King Giglio said, Bulbo, my boy, I am delighted for your sake that Her Majesty has arrived. So am I, said Bulbo. Then Giglio reprieved him for a second time and most graciously invited him to breakfast. As soon as King Padella realized that Rosalba had escaped, he set after the young queen with a huge army, but because King Giglio's advance guard warned him of Padella's movements, Giglio had no fears on that score, and even arranged for a ball in honor of Queen Rosalba for that very evening. Prince Bulbo was given some new clothes for the occasion and was treated as an honored guest by everybody. But it was easy to see he was unhappy. The fact is that the sight of Rosalba, who still wore the fairy black stick's magic ring, set poor Bulbo frantically in love again. It was at the ball that Giglio recognized Rosalba's ring as the one he had had from his mother and had given to Angelica. She, you'll remember, had thrown it away. Countess Grafenough had found it, Giglio had fallen in love with her and offered to marry her. Then it was that Gruffenough had given the ring to the maid Betsinda, I mean Rosalba. All this confusion simply because nobody knew of the strange powers that the fairy Blackstick had given the rose and the ring. When the fairy appeared at the ball, she came up to Giglio and Rosalba and explained the magic. Giglio said, Rosalba needs no ring, I'm sure. She is beautiful enough in my eyes without any enchanted aid. Oh, Giglio, said Rosalba. Take off the ring and try, said the king. She let him remove the ring. In his eyes, she looked as beautiful as ever. What do I care, said the queen, if you think I'm good looking enough? When she heard this, the fairy Blackstick said, Bless you, my darling children. Now you see that a little misfortune has done you good. For she had presented both Giglio and Rosalba with the gifts of a little misfortune at their christenings, much to the surprise and disgust of the two royal families. You, Giglio, she went on, if you had stayed rich, you would scarcely have learned to read and write, and you would have been idle and extravagant and not as good a king as you now will be. Rosalba, you would have been so flattered that you would by now have been as spoiled as Angelica, who thought herself too good for Giglio. The ring had caused so much trouble that Giglio nearly threw it away, but then he noticed Bulbo watching, still looking miserable. Bulbo, my lad, he said, Come and try on this ring. The Queen Rosalba makes it a present to you. The magic properties of the ring were so strong that as soon as he put it on, Prince Bulbo appeared as handsome as he had while he'd carried the rose. Immediately his spirits improved. At this moment, a messenger came rushing in and said, My Lord, the enemy! To arms, cried Giglio. Oh, mercy, said Rosalba, and fainted. Giglio snatched one kiss and rushed forth to the field of battle. Blackstick provided him with magic armor and an enchanted horse which could gallop at any speed you pleased and a magic sword. With all these, Giglio barely needed the three divisions of troops led by Captain Hedzorf and Giglio's college friends, Smith and Jones. The battle was a complete victory for Giglio's army and many great deeds of valor were done. King Giglio himself caught the terrible, tyrannical King Padella. 
he was taken back to King Giglio's headquarters and thrown into the very cell Bulbo had occupied only two days before. The next day, Giglio and the victorious army began the journey back to the Paphlagonian capital, Blombadinga. It was agreed that as soon as they reached the city, Giglio and Rosalba should marry. Orders were sent to the Archbishop of Blombadinga and Duke Hedzoff. Giglio had promoted him after the battle. Hedzoff carried instructions to have the royal palace completely refurnished and freshly painted. Padella and Giglio's uncle, Valoroso, who had stolen Giglio's throne, were both sent to prison. And as for Glumboso, the prime minister who had stolen all Giglio's money, that rogue was sent to the galleys. As the royal party journeyed to Blombadinga, the fairy Blackstick travelled by their majesty's side, offering them the very best advice. She exhorted Giglio to deal justly by his subjects, to draw mildly on the taxes, never to break his promise when he'd once given it, and in all respects to be a good king. A good king, my dear fairy, cried Rosalba. Of course he will. Break his promise? Can you fancy my Giglio would ever do anything so improper, so unlike him? No, never. Why is Fairy Blackstick always advising me and warning me to keep my word? Does she suppose I am not a man of sense and a man of honour? Asked Giglio testily. Methinks she rather presumes upon her position. When the royal party arrived at the last stage before you reach Blombadinga, who should be waiting there with her lady of honour by her side but the Princess Angelica? She rushed towards her husband, who now appeared perfectly lovely to her on account of the fairy ring which he wore, while she herself, wearing the magic rose in her bonnet, seemed entirely beautiful to the enraptured Bulbo. A splendid luncheon was served to the royal party, of which the Archbishop, the Chancellor, the Duke Hedzoff, Countess Gruffanuff, and all our friends partook. Giglio said to Rosalbo, what can have induced that hideous old Gruffanuff to dress herself up in such an absurd way? Did you ask her to be your bridesmaid, my dear? What a figure of fun Gruffy is! And Gruffy ogled the king in such a manner that his majesty burst out laughing. Eleven o'clock, cries Giglio, as the great cathedral bell of Blombadinga tolled that hour. Gruffanuff sighs in a languishing voice, We must be at church before twelve, hiding her old face behind her fan. And then I shall be the happiest man in my dominions, cries Giglio with an elegant bow to the blushing Rosalba. Oh, my Giglio, oh, my dear majesty, exclaims Gruffanuff, and can it be this happy moment has at length arrived? Of course it's arrived, says the king, and I'm about to become the enraptured bride of my adored Giglio. Oh, lend me a smelling bottle, someone. I shall certainly faint with joy. You, my bride, roars out Giglio. You, marry my prince, cries poor little Rosalba. Poor nonsense woman's mad, exclaims the king and all the courtiers. Then Gruffanuff shrieks out, I should like to know who else is going to be married if I'm not. And she handed to his grace the archbishop the document which the prince had signed that evening when she wore the magic ring and Giglio drank so much champagne. And the old archbishop, taking out his eyeglasses, read, This is to give notice that I, Giglio, only son of Savio, king of Paphlagonia, hereby promise to marry the charming... Barbara Griselda, Countess Gruffanuff, and widow of the late Jenkins Gruffanuff Esquire. Hmm, says the Archbishop. A uh, document is certainly a, a, a document. Is it your handwriting, Giglio? cries the fairy Blackstick with an awful severity of countenance. Y yes, poor Giglio gasps out. I've quite forgotten the confounded paper. She can't mean to hold me by it. You old wretch, what will you take to let me off? But Gruffanuff would take nothing but Giglio. She even refused 19 twentieths of Giglio's kingdom. I will not marry her, says he. Oh, fairy, fairy, give me counsel. Why is fairy Blackstick always advising me and warning me to keep my word? Does she suppose I am not a man of honour? Said the fairy, quoting Giglio's own haughty words. He quailed under the brightness of her eyes. Well, Archbishop, said he in a dreadful voice that made his grace start. Since this fairy has led me to the height of happiness but to dash me down into the depths of despair, since I am to lose Rosalba, let me at least keep my honour. Get up, Countess, and let us be married. I can keep my word, but I can die afterwards. 
And so, with this old wretch, Giglio made his way to church in the very carriage that had been got ready to convey Giglio and Rosalba. Though she loved Giglio more than her life, Rosalba was determined, as she told the fairy, not to interfere between him and justice or to cause him to break his royal word. Let us go and see them married, my dear fairy, says she to Blackstick. Let me say my one last farewell to him, and then, if you please, I will return to my own dominions. Before the ceremony at church, it was the custom in Paphlagonia, as it is in other countries, for the bride and bridegroom to sign a contract of marriage. Now, as the royal palace was being painted and furnished anew, it was not ready for the reception of the king and his bride, who proposed at first to take up their residence at the prince's palace, that one which Valoroso occupied when Angelica was born and before he usurped the throne. So the marriage party drove up to this palace. Poor Rosalba stepped out of her coach, supported by Bulbo. As for Blackstick, she, according to her custom, had flown out of the coach window in some inscrutable manner and was now standing at the palace door. Giglio came up the steps with his horrible bride on his arm, looking as pale as if he was going to execution. He only frowned at the fairy Blackstick. Get out of the way, pray, says Gruffana haughtily. Are you determined to make this poor young man unhappy? says Blackstick. To marry him, yes. What business is it of yours? cries Gruffanuff. You won't take the money he offered you? No. You won't let him off his bargain, though you know you cheated him when you made him sign that paper? Impudence! cries Gruffanuff. You won't take anything in exchange for your bond, Mrs. Gruffanuff? cries the fairy with awful severity. I speak for the last time. No, shrieks Gruffanuff, stamping with her foot. I'll have my husband, my husband. You shall have your husband, the fairy Blackstick cried, and advancing a step, laid her hand upon the nose of the knocker. As she touched it, the brass nose seemed to elongate. The open mouth opened still wider and uttered a roar, which made everybody start. The knocker expanded into a figure in yellow livery six feet high, and Jenkins Gruffanuff once more trod the threshold off which he'd been lifted more than 20 years ago. Master's not at home, says Jenkins Gruffanuff, just in his old voice, and Mrs. Gruffanuff, giving a dreadful yelp, fell down in a fit, in which nobody minded her, for everyone was shouting, Hooray! Hooray! Hip hip hooray! Long live the king and queen! Were such things ever seen? No, never, never, never! The fairy Blacksick forever! Bulbo was embracing everybody. The Lord Chancellor was flinging up his wig and shouting like a madman. Heads off and the Archbishop were dancing a jig for joy. And as for Giglio, I leave you to imagine what he was doing. And if he kissed Rosalba once, twice, 20,000 times, I'm sure I don't think he was wrong. So Gruffanuff opened the hall door with a low bow, just as he'd been accustomed to do, and they all went in and signed the book, and then they went to church and were married, and the fairy Blackstick sailed away on her cane and was never heard of more in Paphlagonia. Goodbye. The Trump... Nineteen seventy two for Blue Peter. Hello. Well, ever since Monday, that unusual load has been moving slowly but surely from Hunmanby in Yorkshire down to Southampton in the south of England. 
And it isn't every day of the week you see two prehistoric monsters moving along the road. And obviously, they've attracted a great deal of attention. We'll be telling you how they got on later on in the programme. Now, one of those prehistoric models, the Stegosaurus, was actually longer than a double-decker bus, and Pete is driving a vintage double-decker bus into the studio right now. This is one of London's famous red buses. It first took to the roads 47 years ago in 1925. And as you can see, the driver here is totally exposed. There's no glass in front, no protection from the weather at all. This is, in fact, a Dennis 48-seater open-top double-decker omnibus. It's petrol-driven, the engine. It's a four-cylinder engine. Horsepower about 40, top speed is also about 40 miles an hour. I'm going to change gear and I'll get it into reverse, which is not too easy. Oh, yes, it is. It's gone beautifully there. Four-speed gearbox, and surprise, surprise, I got it into gear first time. As I say, this bus first came into service around about 1925. Get it back into first. And although there were dozens of them around then, this is the only one still in existence that is known now. Ooh, quite an effort. Difficult to drive. All right on top, Val? Yes, it's terrific up here. It'd be lovely on a really nice day. You could really see everything as you pass through the towns and countryside. The only trouble is, of course, there are these wooden slatted seats, which are a little bit uncomfortable, but, of course, being an open-top bus, if it rained, it would be no use having soft padded seats because they'd just soak the rain up. With these, of course, the rain just runs straight off and they can be wiped down. Still, the bus is in very good condition, and that's thanks to Mr Marshall, who owns it, and the London Bus Preservation Group, because, believe it or not, two years ago, this bus was at the bottom of an overgrown garden parked there as a derelict summer house. The group found it, they dug it out, they got rid of all the weeds, and I think now it looks as good as the day it was built. Well, vintage buses like this are causing a great deal of interest nowadays, which is hardly surprising because they are so very different from modern buses. And just compare this with the modern Londoner, which is a very sleek line bus, lots of uh, windows, straight lines there, double doors, one for entry, one for exit, one man operated bus, but for my money, this is far more attractive. I think I agree too, and uh, it's not surprising a lot of people are nostalgic about these old buses. For instance, the old days, you used to get really nice bus tickets instead of those horrid flimsy old bits of paper that you're given these days. Well, in fact, here I've got uh, a ticket board. It's got a complete selection of tickets. As you can see, they're all different colours. They all have their prices marked on them, right the way down to pennies. You don't get penny fares anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, the different fare stages here on the side where passengers can get on and off. And the bus conductor used to take the ticket out, whichever one he wanted. And he had a puncher machine here. And he used to find the right destination marked here on the side where the passenger was getting off, put it in there. It's a lovely old sound. Ting. And there it is. It says where the passenger's getting off. Although this bus did come into service in 1925, it was with a firm called Dominion, and it was bought in 1929 by the London General Omnibus Company, and as well as doing lots of other things to it, they also gave it some blow-up tyres instead of the solid tyres that it used to have. Now, obviously, since 1929, it's had lots of different sets of tyres, but the ones that are put on it now by the London Bus Preservation Group have obviously stood the bus in great stead, because it's just done a 1,500-mile tour of Britain for the British Tourist Board. So, perhaps you've seen it driving past your home. Well, buses have always been very popular. That's probably why lots of models have been made of them, even of some of the vintage ones, like this particular model, which is rather similar to the bus that we've just driven in. In fact, this is a B-type uh, bus from the London General Omnibus Company as well, but as I say, quite open at the front here and very much like the bus that I've just driven in. Just before the First World War, Double-decker buses like this, fairly standard shape, were quite common. In the 60s, along came the Route Master bus, this red bus, which can still be seen on most of the London routes. And then, finally, right up to date here, single-decker one-man buses like the Red Arrow and, of course, the Londoner that I showed you before. But it's amazing how different the designs are now, isn't it? It's just lovely, isn't it? That would make a jolly nice uh, addition to any collection. Would. Well, if you do collect model vehicles, I'm sure you'll know that storing them is something of a problem. If you keep them in an old box all jumbled up together like this, they do tend to get very broken and very scratched pretty quickly. So I think the answer is to have something like this. It's a special model car holder. It's rather nice because it rolls up rather like uh, a carpenter's tool bag. So if you're going off to see friends for the afternoon, you could quite easily take it with you. But if you want to get at your cars, you simply undo it, unroll it like that. You can actually hang it up here because there's a loop at the top. 
And you've got all your cars there. And because I've used polythene sheeting, you can see them very easily indeed. You don't have to sort of pull out each one to find the one you're looking for. You can spot it immediately. And I think it looks very attractive indeed. If you'd like to make one, it's very simple. You can make them any size you like. Of course, it depends how many cars you've got. Um, I've used a piece of pretty strong polythene sheeting, you need first of all. And when you've cut it to size, you then cover it on three sides, two long sides and one short side, with some nice tape. Just makes it look rather attractive. Any colour, I've used red. And leave the top bit uh, uncovered. Leave that free. Now, the next thing you do is to turn up the bottom here. That's, don't forget, got tape on it. Turn it up about five centimetres. And with a paper fastener, you'll find you probably can't get through the tape, so just come in slightly into the corner like that. Push that through. Open the paper fastener out at the back there. You do the same thing on the other end. Another paper fastener. Oops, lost that one. Goes through there. And again, open that out like that. And now you've got the beginnings of your first pocket. Oh, at the moment, of course, it's just one big long pocket. So you've got to put some more paper fasteners in along the front until it looks like that. And, uh, of course, you can make them even sizes if you want, or, of course, you can fit your cars in and just put that in there like that. Fit your cars in and make sure that each pocket fits the car that you want to put in there. Now, you also need to cut some strips of polythene, 10 centimetres wide, and, again, cover them with the tape. This time I've done two short sides, one long side. You leave one long side uncovered. You fold that in half, like that, making sure that the front bit is the bit with the tape on it. And that goes, again, leave enough room for you to be able to get into your cars. That fits, again, like that, up the uh, main sheet of polythene. And again, you put two paper fasteners in the corner. And you put some more paper fasteners along to get your pockets. Until you put the whole lot on, right the way up the sheet like that. And you've got all the different compartments here for your cars. Now, at the top here, the bit that I didn't put tape on, you want to get a piece of doweling and just fold it over like that, enough to make sure that your doweling will slip in easily. And when you put your last pocket on, like that, you fix it on, again with the paper fasteners, and again clipping that down at the back as you do it, so that you hold it together, as I've in fact done, come to the next one here, on this one. There it is, there's the last pocket here on the front, and at the back I've held this bit down there, like that, and the piece of dialing can slip in quite easily. It wants to just show a little bit at either end. Right in the middle paper fastener, I've put the tape, which is going to hold it together when you roll it up. And also on the back here, I've put little bits of sticky tape behind each of the paper fasteners, so that if you hang it on a wall or a door, they won't scratch. And finally, you tie on a little piece of ribbon here. Knot that on at either end. And this is so that you can hold it up like that. And, of course, when you put your cars in, you roll it up from the bottom like that and they don't get damaged at all. And you can just roll that round like that and tie that together. I think it's an extremely neat way of carrying your cars around. And of course, when it's finished, when you've got it at home, you can uh, hang it up like that. There you are. I think it's a jolly efficient uh, model car holder. There are a surprising number of dogs around who, uh, unlike Shep, aren't just family pets, they're working dogs. If Shep lived on a farm, no doubt he would be a working sheepdog. Then there are guide dogs like Honey and Cindy who spend their lives being eyes for the blind. And then, of course, you've got police dogs and guide dogs. We've got one working dog with us today in the studio who's got a very unusual job. He's an actor, and if you think this face is familiar, then you're obviously a Softly Softly fan, because Radar is P.C. Snow's police dog on Softly Softly. Now, if you've seen the programme and seen Radar at work, obviously you know he does some very clever things. And this isn't only because he's a good actor, which he is, it also means that he's been superbly trained. And the person behind Radar's brilliant acting career is his owner and trainer, Dorothy Steves. Now, we thought it would be rather a good idea to try and show you what goes on behind the scenes when uh, an experienced trainer like Dorothy teaches a dog to act in a film or a play. 
<coughs> excuse me, or a play. So to do this, we've made a special film with two leading characters, Radar and myself. In our film, I play the part of a burglar who robs a house and tries to escape with the jewels. But I'm foiled by Radar, who follows me, and after a dramatic chase, he finally gets the jewels back. We called our film The Burglary at the White Cottage, and Radar and I met the film crew at the White Cottage in Buckinghamshire. We started to film in the sitting room. The camera was set up ready for me to make my first appearance as the burglar. I was pretending not to see Radar or the camera, but he spotted me right away. It didn't matter that Radar barked, because all the sound was going to be put on the film later. While I was doing my acting, Radar watched every move I made. This was the bit of the story where I find the jewels in a handbag and then rush off out of the window. Radar didn't move a muscle until he got the word of command from Dorothy. Then he leapt for the window. He was after me like a streak of light. The film crew moved outside the cottage next to film me and Radar coming through the window. But the first one out was Dorothy. She was laying a trail for Radar to follow, and this scene was a real test of his training. Turn over. Nine, take one. Dorothy would shout to Radar to get him to come out of the window, but he couldn't come first. In the story, it's me that Radar has to chase, not Dorothy. So he had to wait in the empty room Radar! until he was called. Get him! The timing was perfect because I drove off just as Radar reached the car. This was the start of the chase. Now John, the director, asked Dorothy how to get some good action pictures of Radar belting along the road. Well, I think if I put him on stay here, yeah. and then I'll tell him to get him as if he was really running after someone. Smashing, OK, yeah. To get the pictures of Radar running, the camera was fixed to the back of this truck. There's room for the director, the cameraman, his assistant, the sound recordist, and the continuity girl. As soon as John was happy, he told the truck to drive off and Dorothy shouted to Radar to follow. Get it! Get it! The pictures taken from this truck look like this. It was hard work for Radar, but he was prepared to carry on. John, the director, wasn't going to let him get tired, though. There were still lots more shots to take, so everybody stopped for a cup of coffee while Radar got his breath back. <laughs> Oh, Radar wasn't left out, though. Dorothy had brought along plenty of fresh water for him. I was glad of a break because it gave me the chance to have a chat with Dorothy. Where, where did Radar come from originally? He came from Brazil. From Brazil? Paulo, Brazil, yes. He's a Brazilian. He's bilingual. Yeah. Yeah. He speaks Portuguese. Does he? Mm. And uh, you, you can give him commands in Portuguese. Yes. He'll, he'll still understand. Oh, yes. Yeah. I was interested to know from Dorothy how Radar had learnt to act and win himself a star part in Softly, Softly. Well, we used to do demonstration classes, you know, for orphanages and yeah. lions clubs and things like that. Did you find he had a natural aptitude? Oh, yes, he learned so fast everything as soon yeah. as we joined the club. And one day we were at a big stadium where the governor was and television cameras, and Radar chose this day to ad lib and do his own performance, and yeah. the audience seemed to love it. It showed off a bit. Yes. Yeah. I well, think he saw the camera. <laughs> well, what, what about uh, training? Uh, do you do anything special on this? Well, I get a script. When I get a script, I yeah. read it through and find out what Radar has to do, yeah. and then try to figure out how best I can get him to do it. I'd like to say there isn't anything that he can't do if it's at all possible. Well, well, we've all had our coffee. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Ready to go. Well, okay, Radar. The, uh, the next We're moving off to the next location now. All right. But when we arrived at the next location, this greeted us. Well, the British weather is upon us and it's starting to rain. Now, Dorothy, is this going to affect uh, radar very much? Well, he doesn't like the rain, but fortunately I carry enough equipment around that I have his raincoat and yeah. his towels and everything else to try to keep him dry. And he's going to be warm as well, in fact. Oh, yes, the coat will keep him warm. Did you come across uh, rain very much, say, on Softly Softly? Well, you know general averages, it does rain sometimes. Yeah. You know, this and is the part that's not glamorous. The thing about it is we've got to carry on, haven't we? Oh, of course, yeah. The film camera is very delicate. Any water getting into it could ruin it. The sound recordist didn't look too happy either, but with a quick wipe of the lens, the filming started again, even though it was teeming down. OK, John? Yes? Action! This was the part of the film where Radar is chasing me but knows a shortcut through the woods to head me off. So he had to leave the road and run to the camera, which was in the trees. 
Luckily, the rain stopped so we could finish the film in comfort. The final shot was very complicated, so John, our director, talked to Dorothy and me to explain what he wanted Radar and me to do. The idea was that during the chase scene, I drove round a corner to find my way blocked by a gate. In the meantime, I want Radar to come rushing through the trees, jumping into the car, grabbing the jewels, and disappear back into the trees again. Yes, please. Um, can you take me and show me where you think radar should start? Yes. And in the meantime, John, can we reverse around the corner and then we'll have a rehearsal and see what it all looks like? Yeah, OK. OK? This was Radar's most difficult piece of acting. Dorothy explained that she'd have to go through it with him very carefully so he'd know what to do. Meanwhile, I'd reverse the car around the corner so I could get a good run up to the camera. Well, look, we'll have a rehearsal. I'll go back down there where the camera is. And as soon as you see the car stop, yes. jump out, let the radar go. All right. OK? That, yes, sir. Right. As John left, Dorothy talked to Radar, getting him to stay where he was until she called him. When Radar understood, the rehearsal began. Everything went well until Radar got into the car. Then there was a slight um, problem. John, could yes. I have this handbag on the other seat, please? Yes, of course could you he can. just sort of How leave it behind you? Yeah. What about there? Radar couldn't get at the handbag of jewels, so John and Dorothy agreed on a place which was easy for Radar and so that the camera could see it. Good boy, good boy, go. go. Radar seemed to cope very well, so everything was set up to do the whole thing again. This time, though, with the camera running. 18, take one. Radar sat waiting for his cue as I came tearing round the corner. Once I got to the gate, I stopped acting because this was Radar's big scene. Fetch! Fetch! Good boy. Come on, quickly. Hurry up. That's it. Come on, quick. Out you go. Good boy. Radar did splendidly. His acting day was over. All that was left now to complete the film was to take some pictures of me driving the car as though I was being chased by Radar. With these shots done, our own film, the burglary at the White Cottage was finished. And as they say in the film industry, everything was in the can. And after we'd finished that day, everything that we shot was then sent off to the film laboratories to be processed. After that, it went along to the Blue Peter cutting room to be edited, and then to the dubbing theatre so that we could add music to make it just a little bit more exciting. So now, instead of just being a hodgepodge of different sequences filmed in a lot of different places, this is what the finished film looks like now. <laughs> Thank you.
training. Congratulations, Radar, and congratulations, Dorothy Steves. It just shows what good dog training can achieve. Yeah. And congratulations, Johnny, for being a very good burglar. Oh, thank you very much. And now for news of those uh, prehistoric monsters that have been on the move now for a couple of days. If you watched on Monday, you'll know that a life-size model of a Stegotaurus, 25 feet long and weighing nearly one ton, and a 22-foot-long Triceratops with a gigantic bony head had to be moved from Yorkshire to the Isle of Wight, and that I gave a hand last Sunday to get them loaded onto a lorry ready for the journey. Well, they set off OK. That was three days ago, and this was the route that they actually planned. Yeah, but uh, as we did say on Monday, we couldn't guarantee just what time the lorries would be arriving at any one place or even which particular roads they were going to use through the main towns. No, it all happened uh, quite early on in the 260 mile, and, uh, 260 mile journey that things started to go wrong. In fact, uh, it was here at Doncaster that the lorry came face to face with a dirty great hole in the road that wasn't there when the route was originally planned. Well, fortunately, the police uh, came to the help and arranged a good diversion. Everything went fine until Tuesday. But then Tuesday down in Hertfordshire here, the terrific winds got up and that slowed them down a great deal. So much so that it seemed quite likely that the Stegosaurus and Triceratops wouldn't reach Southampton on time. Yes, they only reached here, the outskirts of London, on Wednesday morning. And they still, still had all this way to go to catch that ferry that was due to leave Southampton docks at two o'clock precisely. Loop meter cameras were waiting at Southampton to take these pictures. They weren't alone either. Quite a crowd had gathered to have a look at the monsters from the past. But when they finally drove through the dock gates and arrived at the quayside, it was four o'clock. They'd literally missed the boat and it was touch and go whether they'd be able to make the crossing as the Easter holiday rush had already started. Luckily, though, there was just enough space for the Stegosaurus and Triceratops on the half-past-five ferry. So what's probably the strangest load ever to drive the 260 miles from Yorkshire to the south coast of England did finally set sail for its island destination. And the next step will be to get those prehistoric monsters in their new settings, and uh, I hope to give them a hand there too. Well, when the monster park is actually finished, it's going to be a pretty impressive sight, because as well as the Stegosaurus and Triceratops, there's also going to be a Brachiosaurus, a Polycanthus, a Dodicarus, and Tyrannosaurus Rex, sounds like a pop festival, and several others. I'm glad he said that, not me. <laughs> But the, all these monsters are going to come from the very same place up in Yorkshire. They'll be travelling along the same road, ro road and the same route. Uh, so if you miss them that first time, there will be another chance in a couple of months' time. There won't be the usual Blue Peter on Monday because it's Easter Monday, but there is a chance to see again the boys at Starehe because there's going to be another special showing of the film that I made in Kenya with Princess Anne, Blue Peter, Royal Safari. And it was after that film that we received all those letters from you asking if there was anything you could do to help those boys. But before that, on Easter Saturday, I'm actually going to be on the radio. I'm going to be the guest on Desert Island Discs. And we'll be back with Blue Peter a week today after Easter, and uh, I'll be all dressed up in feathers. So have a nice Easter. We'll Happy see you Easter. then. Bye-bye. <laughs> The episode... Quoth the blue fly, hum, quoth the bee, buzz and hum the cry, and so do we. Oh, now, Adamkos, even thistle down will fall to thy blade. <laughs> 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 
Great Mother Tanny Tine Folk thee! Come, magic telling bone, summon the voices. Shh. Are you there, spirits? <laughs> <laughs> 